I just know you're going to love the guests that we have on in this episode, so don't go away. Welcome to another episode of The Interview. I'm Dr. Rick Wodge. I'm here with two exquisite guests with us this week. And the first is Ryan White with... Faith and Messiah. Faith and Messiah. And we also have Dr. Gina Dye with Foundations in Torah. Correct, my friend. Hey, what are you guys doing right here in Texas? What are you doing? Uh, well, we're trying to avoid the rain. Uh <laughs> okay. Good luck with that. Yeah. Well, so we just filmed a brand new series called Revelation Unmasked. 11 parts, and uh, guaranteed to shift people's paradigm. Just a little. <laughs> In what way? Well, you know, a lot of times people have really focused on Revelation as being about the end times and death and destruction and things like that. And we want to take a step back and look at what did it mean to the first century audience? How did the, the people who originally received the book, how did they understand it? Why did they find it meaningful? And, and why did they preserve it for future generations? Good. Yeah, we're really trying to focus in on the history and the culture and, you know, especially the context. And we do all that before we start to make an application for modern day. So it, it's a bit, you know, it, it's different. It's going to challenge some people, but I think we've got to bring it back. You know, the writer wrote for a reason. Uh, how the writer communicated his interpretation matters. And so our goal is to try to understand what the writer's interpretation was. How is this going to differ from all these works that have come out on <laughs> video and volumes of books. I'm thinking of one that's about that big with all the books put together called Left Something. Uh, <laughs> how is it going to differ from that? Well, <laughs> to begin with, we're, we're going to look at, as Dina was saying, we're going to look at the what, what were the original audience seeing? What were they, they dealing with? And a lot, of, a lot of people just don't know that there was a lot of struggles back then. Christianity was not the only new religion on the scene. Not that it really is a, necessarily a new religion, because it's obviously a continuation of, of Israel's tradition. But imperial cult, the worship of Caesar as a god, was actually the fastest growing religion in all of the world. And in Asia Minor, where John writes all of his letters to, the entire region is just consumed with worshiping Caesar. In fact, cities were competing between each other to see who could worship him the best and who could build him the biggest altars, the biggest temples, and give him the biggest honors. Yeah, that was especially true for the, the uh, churches in, the, in Asia Minor. Mm -hmm. And things were, you know, we think of, that they were experiencing extreme persecution, but they really weren't by that time. Emperor Domitian really wasn't persecuting them. They were living pretty comfortable lives. The Jewish community there in the cities were very prosperous. They, they served as officials of the city in city planning, city government. They were well-to-do. So we're looking at Revelation from that perspective. What do you do when you're in comfort mm -hmm. and uh, how do you not compromise with the culture? Uh, have you discussed dating of the, uh, of the book? <laughs> Not for we're, we're, <laughs> no. Sorry. Well, we we have not discussed setting any dates in our future. No, no, but, no, but the date itself or when yes. the film was written. Uh, yeah, so we we did discuss the date. Uh, so there's there's two major opinions. One is that it was written around sixty between sixty sixty five A.D. and oftentimes that is is said to well, it's predicting the destruction of the temple. And then the other major school of thought is somewhere in the 90s AD, during the time of Emperor Domitian, at 60s was Emperor Nero. And my personal belief, based on what I've studied, and, and Dina agreed with me on this, is that it was most likely written in the 90s AD, but it is also in a, in a very heavy way looking back in the 60s where we have the destruction of the temple, because even 30 years, 20, 30 years later, people are going to be really still reeling from the destruction of the temple because that was the center of their world. That was that was the sign of God's favor and the sign of God's covenant. Yeah, I mean, that's ground zero for their world. Everything was conducted in the temple. Their judicial, commercial, economic, business, uh, religious. And of course, that's the seat of the king. Uh, second temple period, of course, we have the high priest. So 
uh, we had the first examples when the Babylonians destroyed the temple and the city, and so Rome is following suit. We, uh, we cannot appreciate just how challenging that is to have the, the temple destroyed and nothing left. So, uh, but yeah, I think Ryan's assessment, I think, makes sense that, you know, it was written later, but it was about that period of time. So many theologians have looked at this from so many different perspectives. Oh, yeah. uh, one of those that is predominant is the uh, seven ages of the churches uh, that can be seen, they say, from the seven churches listed uh, and their characteristics right. listed within the That's book of serious. Revelation. So, <laughs> so what do you think of that? So I, I just have to say I disagree with that. Um, the, the reality is, is that those were actually seven real churches. And if you actually follow the, the, the ancient, what you call the mail route, the, the route that you would take to travel to each of those locations from Patmos is the exact same order that they appear in this book. And not only that, when we look at the descriptions in each of those letters, each of them has geographic or economic descriptors that fit those cities. Let me give you a, a quick example. Laodicea, right? Yeshua says, I would that you'd be hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, I'm going to vomit you out. Well, in the city of Laodicea, they did not actually have any source of natural sources of water in that city. So they had to pipe in spring water, hot water, from uh, about six miles away. And if they wanted cold water, they had to go to the mountains and, and, and get it. And so by the time it gets to Laodicea, it's lukewarm. So they're, they're kind of playing on these, these real things in these real cities. Characteristics within the cities themselves. Yes. Now, there's a statement. That's, well, I was just going to, yes. there's a possibility that uh, the cities were actually founded by the priestly class in Jerusalem. Because we have something from Josephus that tells us that Titus... Uh, allowed them to escape before the destruction of the city to get out of Dodge, basically, and that they migrated there to Asia Minor. And so much of the language that we see in, in the letters has to do with the temple, because the, it possibly these, these were serving in the temple in some capacity. So, you know, one of the statements that has been used by so many Protestant theologians and Catholic as well, is the statement that's made early on in the book of Revelation that says, Come up here and I will show you and what will take place. And with those few words that I believe are taken out of context, we're going to see where you guys are. They say that that is the uh, removal of the church, those that are saved, uh, in what is called the rapture. Okay, what do you, what do you think? Well, first of all, we have to look at the ancient Near East world. Uh, the predominant structure in the ancient Near East world was a temple. And temples were always located on the tops of mountains. And temples were the place where heaven and earth connected. In fact, when you went to the temple, it was said that you were entering into heaven. So this part of the sphere of the temple was heaven and the other part was earth. It was where the two points came together. And they would, also, they would always speak of going up. Yes. To the temple. Yes, because it was always on a mountain. <laughs> and so who was going up into the temple? Well, the priests would be serving up there. They were the mediators between heaven and earth and between God and man. And so John was of the priestly class, would have entered into that sphere known as heaven, even though, you know, it was the temple. So it, it likely has more to do with that than anything about anyone escaping or, you know, I think our understanding of temples and, and heaven and earth is, a, you know, a little amiss. I, I think it's, it, it would surprise a lot of people if you actually just study out the, the history of the rapture doctrine. We, outside of a couple little people who are really minor blips in, in history, no one has believed in this doctrine until somewhere in the early 1800s. There was a, a girl who had a vision. This gets picked up by John Darby. He can't sell it in England, so he comes over to the United States uh, around the time of the Civil War, and he sells this, this message that you're going to escape tribulation to a bunch of people who are going through tribulation. Mm -hmm. And so it's gotten very popular in America. But in reality, most Christians in the rest of the world don't believe in or, or just don't even you know, bother with this idea of the rapture doctrine. The escapism clause uh, to me is one of the most damaging things that uh, has been yes. manufactured in the uh, Christian church today. Absolutely. And to me, I mean, we could really spend the rest of this time <laughs> just talking about it, how nonsensical it is, and how unbeneficial it is. 
Well, we don't understand our mandate. So, you know, the garden is where it all began. And Adam set up as king in the garden to rule and extend that the garden to the four corners of the earth. And so we have the same responsibility. So the earth is said to be a garden. And our mandate then is to take uh, what we've grown in the garden, if you will, and, and provide food for those uh, outside and to expand the kingdom. You know, it's not about going anywhere. It's about uh, being a good steward here and expanding the kingdom on earth. Yeah. Yeah. The, the escapist mentality leads to this idea of the, the earth is going to be destroyed. Who cares anyways? Uh, you know, what's going on, un unfortunately, in a lot of circles. And this has just led to a, a lot of apathy and to a place where the, the, the church grew through discipleship. I mean, you can read the, the Didache. Uh, it was one of my favorite documents from the, the early Christian church. And it was, if you wanted to join our movement, you discipled yourself to a person for years. And you look at how many people are falling away from the church today. There's no discipleship because it's all about, you know, believe in this doctrine so that you can, can escape when in reality, Revelation is teaching faithful discipleship in this world during hard times. And we have a great example going on right now in Iran, right? This, uh, the, the church is growing at a pace unseen anywhere on the planet in Iran. And it's, uh, th there's no walls, there's no structure, there's no church. And it's being led by women who are discipling. And they, they talk about, you know, converts fall away, but disciples, those are who have mentored in the faith of the, are the ones that are, you know, expanding the kingdom there. So uh, that's just proof to me that that's, that's what we're about. In the Western world, we want comfort and ease. Mm -hmm. And so a doctrine like the rapture fits perfectly mm -hmm. with what we would like to buy from the local store. Yeah. It just so happens the local store tends to be the pulpits in most of America. And, and I find it to be sad. I also find another thing, uh, it's too bad I wasn't on the show with you guys, but <laughs> I would have taken up all the time. But uh, another thing is the lights, camera, and action. I know we have lights, camera, and action here, but this is a TV show. Church is not a TV show. And I'm wondering who we're worshiping. Are we worshiping the people who've come to sit or the God who doesn't need lights, camera, and action? Well, I mean, a lot we see in the church is just entertainment. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's all I see. I mean, we've forgotten that, that we, the Bible shows us a protocol, a pattern on how we enter into the presence of the king. That's not what we're doing in church. And I would also say that the church today looks like it's married to the culture. Mm -hmm. This was the big problem in pre-World War II Germany. There was no distinction between the Lutheran church and the Nazi party. They were one and the same, and we're doing the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's very disconcerting to see that. I mean, it's, you know, let's talk, come out of her, my people. Um, you know, it's time to declare truth in the marketplace, uh, not be afraid. I mean, compromise is killing us mm -hmm. and assimilation. And, and that's what we see that one of the biggest messages in Revelation was these seven churches, the majority of them, you guys are compromising. You know, the, the doctrine of Jezebel, the doctrine of Balaam, these sorts of things. It was all about, hey, you know, I, I know you're offering incense to Caesar, but look at all the benefits with this. And we know Caesar's not really a god, so let's go ahead and do that. And, and so Revelation, what, one of the big things that it does is it reveals heaven's perspective. It's, it's taking off the blinders and saying, you know, for example, the, the harlot that we hear about. It, in Roman culture, Rome was um, personified as the goddess Roma. Right, who was this beautiful woman, and everyone just just gained so much from Rome and, and the goddess Roma. And what John is doing is he's he's pulling off the blinders in a sense. He's revealing that Roma is actually a prostitute. She's actually selling herself out, and that by partaking in this, you are in fact sleeping with a prostitute by compromising. So this series you guys have just filmed is eleven parts. Mm -hmm. And uh, where are people going to be able to get a hold of this thing? Well, well, we'll be showing it on Israel TV Network probably once or twice. Uh, but we also have a website, revelationunmasked.com, and that'll be, uh, we'll have pay-per-view there. But we'll also be posting a bibliography of all the sources we used. I mean, we, we got a lot of books, and we've covered a lot of scholars, and we looked at scholars we didn't agree with and scholars we did. And we, we, in our conversation with this series, tried to pull out what we thought 
made sense and what would be beneficial to everyone. So yeah, revelationunmasked.com. Yeah, okay. we're, we're really hoping to kind of build this into something that, that can be a, a resource for people like, you know, the, the, the resources there, but also ways to kind of get in further in depth with some of our own personal teachings. And, you know, hopefully people will maybe kind of take the initiative and, and maybe ask, you know, invite Dina and I out to speak and we can actually do this live and, and maybe even answer some questions. Maybe are... answer some questions. <laughs> okay, now, if they wanted to do that and have you guys come out and speak, and I'm assuming you'll probably have DVDs that they could buy yeah, from yeah. the series. Yeah. How would they do that? How would they get a hold of you? I, I would say either one of our websites. I, my email address is on my website, okay. and they can just send me an email note. Faithofmessiah.com is, is my website, and you can contact me through there. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you could just duck, duck, go, Dina, die, and uh, I'll come up, and you, yeah, just send me an email. <laughs> Can't do that with me because Ryan White was also a famous uh, oh, transplant. There you go. That's a problem HIV, right so. there. Yeah, we're really excited. Uh, I think it's time. So we're kind of a bridge between the world of scholarship and the folks because mm -hmm. most people are not going to read some of the books that we have read. And we've taken that information and kind of uh, summarized it and tried to present it in a way that's easy to understand. What were some of the takeaways for you guys on this? <laughs> that's there's, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot there. I just, for me, it really encouraged me to try to make a difference in the world. That the, the book of Revelation shows us as, as believers growing into a temple, the, the New Jerusalem. A lot of times it's kind of masked because people don't, don't understand the temple language, but the New Jerusalem is a temple, the, the entire city. There is no temple because the whole city is the temple. And the temple was a place where God dwells with humanity. And I, I see the, the New Jerusalem now as a place where we are, we are today. We, we are the New Jerusalem today, but it's also a vision of what we are to grow into as well. And when you look at it, there, there's just some amazing characteristics. It's a city with 12 gates, which of course reminds us of the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 apostles. So we're founded on the apostles, are founded on Israel, but it's a place where the gates are always open. We're, we're to be a place that is always open and inviting, just like Yeshua. He, didn't, he never turned down an invite to a party. He went with, with prostitutes, with tax collectors, with sinners, with all the people that the, the good religious people would never be seen with. And we're called to, to have that openness there. And, and then also the, that river flowing out with the trees of life that are for the healing of the nations. That's our call. That's our role. We're not called to, to well, Jesus has done it all for us. Now we're just going to sit around and wait to be you know sucked up into the sky or whatever. We're called it's our role, our job is for the healing of the nations. Mm -hmm. I mean, it takes us right back to the garden. We yeah. always end up right back there. I you think know, there, there was, was a, a song. <laughs> there was a river that, flew out of the gar that flowed out of the garden that was went to the nations as well. It's kind yeah. of interesting. <laughs> yeah, so, I, and the other thing is uh, what people don't realize or don't recognize is that the Bible's actually a pretty political book. Mm -hmm. We find that Israel is always having to deal with the nations. You know, if she's in Egypt or in Babylon or if the Assyrians have come in and in the first century Rome, and they're always having to address the nations around them and the culture around them. This is nothing new. And so that's a good message for us today. We're dealing with exactly the same thing. Okay, so let's uh, imagine for a moment that um, uh, Yochanan, John, the Apostle John, uh, did not live in some part of the first century, write some part in the first century, but that he wrote in the 21st century. And uh, he wrote from America. And he was witnessing what was going on today in our the nation and uh, with what's going on politically. What would have changed in his writing? <laughs> I mean, one of the things we have to say is in the ancient world, they described stuff using this sort of outer, uh, you know, otherworldly language. And so we don't talk like that. So they're talking about cataclysmic events and things going on in the sky, things melting, you know, the sun darkening and stars falling out. And we take it all literally, but they're actually referring to events 
because of a broken covenant between Israel and God, this is what it looks like. You know, it manifests itself in the sky, but it's real time events of the destruction of the temple. So he'd have to change uh, his description a little bit. <laughs> I, I think that we, you know, we still would see a little bit of that. I mean, we, we talk about nations rising and falling, that no nation literally falls. <laughs> Right, but we, we still use that language. I think that we, we might also even find incorporated in like 9-11 language, like, you know, towers collapsing and smoke and and maybe, you know, references to atomic bombs and just things that, because th this is the thing that, that I've learned. I, I've, I haven't been a teacher that long, <laughs> but I, I've learned by watching other teachers and I've realized, you know, we focus so much when, when someone wants to be a teacher, they focus so much on the material, but we really don't learn how to communicate. And you can have the best information in the world, but if you don't know how to communicate it, doesn't matter. And in order to communicate, you have to meet people at the level that they're at. You have to use words and, and terminology. You know, I could I could sit here and throw out all sorts of Hebrew words because I've studied Hebrew a lot, but no one would understand me. No one would be able to communicate. That's the same thing that John is doing. He's using language that they understand. And he he's revealing things. So I think that some of the things that he would he would be targeting today. The advertising industry, uh, the the big big pharmacy, big uh, big, tech. big tech, yeah, all of these things. You know, we we don't even recognize how how much these other these these big corporations are going into and destroying other nations. Uh, there was one of the books that we used to study, written 20 years ago, 20 30 years ago, is really fascinating because they were talking about you know, where, where are we going with Revelation? And they talked about big corporations are going down to South America. And they are, they were, this is 20, 30 years ago, they were selling these countries on modern medical systems and saying, we will finance it. And then when the, com the country could not you know, repay them, they said, it's all right, just give us some of your land. And so now most of the farming land in South America is owned by big corporation, big multinational corporations. And they use their machines, they kick all the local tenants out, all those local tenants go into cities, drugs, and no joke, 20, 30 years ago, this guy writing this book said there's going to be a migrant crisis. Wow, yeah. The migrant crisis today is being funded, is, is caused by big tech. And see, they act like tyrants. So this is the battle Israel's had with tyrants from the very beginning, even back in the garden. That's what we're dealing with, with the snake. But, you know, Babylon, uh, Assyria, Persia, all of that. And so it's how, you know, how do you function under tyrants? And so this is uh, basically, that's exactly what they're doing, Under oppressing yours. the people. Okay. One of the things, wait, one yeah. thing I wanted to share, because uh, so it, to my mind, if, you know, if you look at a still life, I mean, it's perfect, right? You've seen, st I mean, it's just the colors are exact and the lines and everything, and you know what it is. It's a pair, right? But when the Impressionist painters came in, what did they do? Like everything was a dot. And when you went up close and looked at their work, you could not tell what it was until you went and stood way back. And so that's kind of how the language of, of Revelation is. You know, we want it to be a still life, but I'm sorry, you know, it's a bunch of dots that make no sense. If we don't stand back and look at the culture and context and history of the time, we're not gonna know what we're seeing. Great. <laughs> okay, so um, there were ethical issues that were being dealt with, not just within the uh, population, within the government system, uh, but also within the, the church, the church, we say, the, the congregations. Has that changed? The heart of man never changes. <laughs> See, I mean, the temple at the time, Second Temple, was a completely corrupt institution led by men who were lording it over the people, graft, bribery, uh, corruption, you name it, was going on in the temple. And, uh, you know, men carries his heart to, you know, to the next event. And so this, I would submit the same things going on there. Yeah, I mean, you just look at the news and how, many, how often do we see some... A pastor who's you know caught in you know an extramarital affair, or they've been propping up their book sales using church funds, or you go into the, the Catholic world and you know they're you know shifting the priests around to with all the yeah, it's all big business. It's uh, become yeah. big business. It's it's we're no longer calling sin sin and 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 calling these people out and, and actually holding leaders accountable. It's just it's a free for all. I think that's the number one issue. We, we, don't, we don't hold our government leaders to account. We don't hold our church leaders to account.
and another thing I, you know, I just thought of is, is we don't accept apologies and, and we don't promote forgiveness. When was the last time you heard a politician actually stand up and say, you know what, I messed up? I mean, just literally just said, I messed up. So they'll, they'll kind of beat around the bush. Well, I didn't really say that. I, I tell you, I would vote for someone who said, you know what, you called me out. I was absolutely dead wrong. I should not have done that. That was horrible for me to say, I repent. Yeah, it might have been 1860. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so a person who watches this series, 11-part series, Revelation Unmasked, what are they going to come away with and what hopefully will change within their life, their neighborhood, their house, their... What's going to change? Well, hopefully everything. Uh, but we did, we concluded the series with reality. And although we wove it into all of the various episodes that we were talking about, because that's the point. The book is supposed to make sense for us now. Things mm -hmm. just keep repeating, cycles repeat. And so what was it that helped those people dealing with the time that they were in? And not necessarily a persecution time, but a time of assimilation and, and compromise. And so our hope is that now people can look around and going, we're fat, dumb, and happy. And so how do, you know, how do we deal with this culture? Uh, we need to engage it in some ways, but in some ways we, we need to push back. And so how do we, how do, we do that? I, we don't have all the answers, but that's what we're encouraging people. Yeah. And, and one of my big hopes with this was just, there's a lot of people who've just been beaten, broken, and abused by the book yeah. of Revelation, by, by interpretations of it. And my hope is that, that those people who have just put it on the, the shelf and said, I don't even want to look at it, I don't want to think about it, that they can say, oh, you know what? Maybe I need to reread this book, and maybe there is a different way to actually read and understand this book, and maybe this book can give me hope and encouragement for today and not, not just scare me. Yeah, new eyes. I, I mean, sometimes you just need some new eyes on it. Right. Yeah. So we're hoping this is going to go on the shelves and be available for pay-per-view, uh, down, downloadable? Is it downloadable? We maybe in the future. Yet. Maybe um, in the future. Yeah, DVD. Uh, DVD as well. Hopefully by Hanukkah. Yeah. So people can buy that for Hanukkah. That would be great. It'll, and it'll fit right in because they were dealing with the exact same thing at Hanukkah, right? Yeah. What's new? There's nothing yeah. new under the sun. Ryan White, Dr. Dina Dye, it's good to have you guys on the set. Thank you for it's, having us. It's uh, been a pleasure and honor to, to watch you guys as you've molded this thing together. And uh, I can't wait to see it myself. So. Me too. Well, thanks. <laughs> thanks for having us, Rick. Thank you. <laughs> we will see you next time on the interview. And make sure that you go to revelationunmasked.com. You're going to be glad you did. We'll see you next time. Shalom, shalom. Shalom. shalom.